Hello, I am Liam Peeper, author of the best-selling historical novel, The Toymaker, as well as the life-exploding memoir, the feel-good hit of the year. I am coming to you live from my room in quarantine, here to talk to you about my new novel, Sweetness and Light. Sweetness and Light is... Um, when I started writing Sweetness and Light, I imagined the sort of book you might pick up from the bookstore to read on an aeroplane as you go on a holiday. Uh, it published into a world where we no longer have holidays or airlines and bookshops are struggling and I don't know if I'm ever going to be on an aeroplane again, so I guess it's accidentally historical fiction. But if you liked my last novel, The Historical Fiction, you're in for a treat. I guess Sweetness and Light is sort of a tropical gothic set on the backpacker trail of a few years ago. Those places you go looking for adventure and, you know, opening your eyes and your mind to the world, spiritual epiphany, all that. And the seedy underbelly that tends to spring up in those towns. It's kind of a thriller set in that world of con men, tourists, scams, bad romance, cults, all that good stuff. It's a little bit dark, it's a little bit sexy. Imagine Eat, Pray, Love, but a horror story. So I love to read those books, those books about travel, about exploring the world, new countries. And there are centuries of really wonderful stories of travel through the world and travel through India in particular. There's a huge canon of literature about traveling through India, going back forever. You know, E.M. Forster, Nepal, Elizabeth Gilbert. I love all of those stories, those really evocative travel stories. And, you know, I looked at that canon and I thought, you know, that canon of outsider author literature about India. And I thought, what if a white man wrote yet another story to cram in that story hole? But there's a reason so many books are set in India, you know, it's the vastness of it, the rivers, the deserts, the seething socio-political tectonics of the cities. On any given day in Mumbai, you're likely to see something that's going to completely rewire your worldview. You know, even when you live in Mumbai, it's one of those cities where even for people born and live there their whole life, the sheer plurality and complexity of the place is confounding. You know, some of the most Streetwise and canny people I know can handle situations that would make me lose my tiny mind. But they're cool. But then take them a couple of kilometers down the road and the whole cultural context is changed and they're just as lost as me. And that fascinated me, that discombobulation, that being moved out of your own frame of reference and what that does to you. And it happens to me every time I go to India, more so than any other place. Uh, every time I've been, I've gotten lost in one way or another. First time I went, I was just a kid and right at that crossroads of young and stupid. And I got myself immediately into trouble with the local gangster and then the local police. And well, the rest is all in this book. You should buy it. It's very affordable. Second time I was older and I was an author already quite jaded, thought I'd seen everything. And I got my ass kicked again, but this time in the middle of the country, in this austere ashram in the desert. Third time, I went and it happened again, and so it goes, and so on. Sweetness and Light follows the intertwined stories of Connor, an Australian con man, thief, sex guy who preys on lonely travellers, and Sasha, who's fundamentally a good person looking to fix something terrible that happened to her by following in the mentorship of a guru. They're each from different worlds, different continents, but both ultimately wanting the same thing, which is to escape through themselves. Uh, through discovering another person, which is something we can all relate to, I think. Some things are universal across all cultures, you know, and being too horny for your own good is right up there. So two real life misadventures on either side of this either side of India inspired this story. In Goa, a run-in with a con artist that escalated into this very weird sort of psychosexual showdown when I was a kid. Uh, Connor is loosely based on that guy. And across the country a decade later, I spent some time in a sort of a 60s style utopian community like all utopias from the 60s ended in tragic comedy and in very dicey territory. That's where we meet Sasha. There's this independent city state just outside Pondicherry in Tamil Nadu, which until the 60s had been colonized by European powers, uh, most recently the French. And it's basically this giant French speaking ashram 
dedicated to the pursuit of the spiritual over the material. At the same time, it runs entirely on cheap labor of local people. And it's this incredible time capsule, not only of 60s uh, spiritual idealism, but also this weird hangover of colonial privilege. And I want to keep that in mind and at the same time to pay homage to that tradition of the wide-eyed picaresque in a dazzling new place. You know, I wanted to write about the inherent problem in the idea that you can make yourself a better person by going on holiday. It's something that a lot of people have written about, you know, this finding yourself on holiday, you know, while traveling, but I wanted to flip it and to take this idea and write it from the other side. You know, like it's entirely possible to go traveling with the intention of having a real experience and of interacting with a new culture and a new place and find a new mindset, but being unable to shake your own paradigm. My characters do that to a greater or lesser extent. You know, taking off across the world to start a new life dedicated to, say, uh, charity work or studying yoga it might be very brave personally, but it's in the service of the kind of self-actualization reliant on a web of privilege and status that we're so often blind to. You know, those things like class, racial hierarchy, the theft of resources and cultural riches, those old colonial avenues of exploitation, they never really went away. They just evolved into new forms. And it's something that we all take advantage of when we travel, whether we think about it or not. And if you stop to think about what's going on in terms of power dynamics in the long, slow wake of post-colonial societies, things get complicated, you know? Turn the intersectional lens a fraction away from the empowerment narrative of a traditional travel adventure, and suddenly, eat, pray, love becomes less aspirational and maybe even a little sinister, which is a sort of a gray area I wanted to explore in Sweetness and Light. Uh, many of the book's characters are uh, inspired by real life counterparts, especially the guru, who is the big bad, uh, you know, based on real life charismatic figures like Bikram Chaudhuri, Anne Hamilton Byrne, John of God, amongst many, you know, people who appropriate religious and spiritual traditions to justify all kinds of misdeeds. That's something I was very interested in. And in this novel, I tried very hard to evoke a world where travelers are undone by their own hubris and privilege, uh, where despite good intentions, uh, vaguely sinister religious fundamentalists can prey upon, upon complacency and unhappiness. And I think there's a lot of unhappiness in our culture. We are, or were until very recently, living in a time of comfort, of unprecedented, uh, if not wealth, then a lack of scarcity and at a time of unprecedented mobility for Australians and for other Western countries. But still, there was so much unhappiness. Everything is great and everyone's miserable. And there's an inalienable confusion caused by that unhappiness. You know, our culture programs us to believe inherently that there's nothing, that, no problem that can't be solved and no malaise that we can't buy our way out of, you know. It's the insidious thing about capitalism is there's nothing it can't eat. It seeps into your bones and rewrites you from the ground up and programs you to believe that there's nothing that can't be fixed with money. So when you meet something that can't be fixed with money, uh, it's incredibly discombobulating. And a lot of people, I think, uh, take off to travel at a certain time in life to try and square that circle. Which ties back to the type of travel I wanted to write about. The idea that if you have some kind of spiritual and emotional malaise, you can fix it by going on holiday. That somewhere out there, there's a experience or a enlightenment you can trade for money that will cure your heartache. The idea that buying something will make you happy which is not a new idea in Western cultures, but becomes more problematic when the thing you're trying to buy is someone else's culture, time, or tradition. Especially comparatively, especially when comparative economies and the privilege that accompany them come into play. You know, uh, often when people talk, who talk about wanting to find themselves, you, know, you might have heard this phrase, I want to find myself. Uh, what that really means often is someone wants to find themselves in an economy where the exchange rate lets them live with the consequence of a monopoly game, you know? If you wanna get a look 
at the Australian Id. Check out Cooter Beach at closing time. But we are in an interesting moment where the global discourse is taking on uh, a greater understanding of race and colonialism and history and its place in the greater global story. There's this great essay I thought about a lot while writing uh, Sweetness and Light. It's by Jess Rowe and it's in her collection White Flights, Race, Fiction and the American Imagination. You should check it out. But it's all about someone like me discovering, you know, a fairly comfortable white person that they've been trained not to see your own race and position in the broader cultural, racial, socio-economic context. Uh, and that's something a lot of people come up against when they travel. It's something a lot of people travel to come up against and confront. When you, when you face that image of yourself, then you can change, you can become a different person. And this can either be an epiphany, you know, a true intellectual and spiritual awakening, or it can be, uh, you know, the performing of an epiphany and leaving it at that. And there's a whole lot of people out there who will take advantage of someone looking to have that epiphany. In the book, it's predators like Connor and charlatans like the guru. You know, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow is a supervillain, but this is a book that asks, what if Gwyneth Paltrow was a supervillain? Um, it was my hope that this book would make people think a little about what they took for granted about their own travel, their travel habits and those foundational opaque layers of privilege that so many of us have abused for so long without really thinking about it. In some ways it's a story about the limits of empathy and the dehumanizing of people born across borders from you. How we can do that while thinking that we are doing the right thing which I think is a question which is particularly urbane at the minute that we're living in this unprecedented historical moment. But I digress, all of that makes the book sound very boring. It's not, I promise, out of all the novels I've written, this is definitely the second, uh, but it's good, I promise. It's a good book. Ultimately, it's a great read. It's about travel. It's about what I love about travel, warts and all. And I wanted to give something back to that tradition of literature where you open a book and you feel like you're somewhere far from home. I love books like that. And they give me, the books that give me that feeling of, of flight and of adventure. And hopefully I've done that here. And hopefully you'll get that same kick out of reading it that I did writing it. And I hope one day we'll all have a chance to travel again and see the world again. But until then, we have got books. And I hope you get a chance to read it. And if you are at all interested, give your local bookseller a call and see if they can help you out. Things are tough out there right now. It's scary, but chances are your community store can get the book to you fast and safely. So please stay safe, look after each other, wash your hands, uh, give me good reviews online, five stars please, and thank you. And I'll see you on the other side.